Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And um, really, uh, you know, good afternoon. Uh, if uh, you're you're in the UK, only just good evening uh, to our Australian colleagues uh, who are joining us this evening. Um, and thank you very much for joining us for, for the launch of Antonio Wimbush's new book, Auto Fiction, uh, a female francophone aesthetic of exile, which was published just last month in the Contemporary French and Francophone Cultures series uh, at Liverpool University Press. And I should just say, uh, the book is available with a 30% discount for all those who registered for today's event. And you should have been sent the voucher if you registered today by email, but uh, Cathy, uh, my colleague at the IMLR is gonna post uh, a reminder in the chat and Antonia has also got the discount code on, on her slide. So she'll remind you in, in a moment. So today we're hosted by the, the Institute of Modern Languages Research and in particular, the Center for Contemporary Women's Writing. My name is Joe Ford and I'll be chairing today's event. So today's event is, is really a celebration, I think, of Antonia's uh, book um, and, and the work that's gone into to, to, to writing the book. Um, but it's also an opportunity for us to have an exchange about the many ideas with which the book engages, namely uh, literary representations of exile and how gender and sexuality figure within discussions around exile, uh, particularly in the Francophone post-colonial context. So in addition to the author herself, we've got three eminent specialists of French Francophone women's writing, Leslie Barnes, Amelina Damley, and Natalie Edwards uh, here with us today to celebrate the launch of, of Antonia's book. So um, the, 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 the structure of the session today, each speaker is going to speak for about uh, 10 minutes. Um, and I understand that each uh, panelist will refer to a particular uh, novelist that's uh, spoken about in, in, in Antonia's book. We'll then open up to around 30 minutes of discussion and questions from the audience. Please do pop your questions in the chat. The chat is open. Um, and we'll then come back and invite you to ask your question live if you'd like to. Um, if you prefer not to ask your question live, then you can just indicate in the chat and I will very happily put your question to, to Antonia. Um, just a reminder that today's session is being recorded. Uh, so if you don't want to be recorded, then uh, you should turn off your camera now. Um, before we begin then, I'll, I'll just briefly introduce uh, our author and our speakers, and then I'll pass over to Antonia, who's gonna spend a bit of time introducing the key themes of her book. So. First of all, Antonia Wimbush is uh, a Levy Hume Early Career Fellow in the Department of Modern Languages and Cultures at the University of Liverpool. Her current research project investigates cultural responses to post-war Caribbean migration to metropolitan France. And in addition to the book that we're launching today, Antonia is the co-editor of uh, Queering, Querying Bodily Norms with Francophone Culture, which came out uh, with Peter Lang just this year. Our first panelist, Leslie Barnes, is Senior Lecturer of French Studies at the Australian National University. Her first book, Vietnam and the Colonial Condition of French Literature, which came out with Nebraska in 2014, offers a literary history of 20 and, uh, 20th and 21st century France that figures broader crossings and contact with colonial other as constitutive elements of metropolitan literary production. Her current project studies literary and cinematic narratives that engage with questions of sex work, mobility, and human rights in Southeast Asia. She has published on these and other uh, subjects in the Journal of uh, Vietnamese Studies, Modern Language. She's also the co-editor of the cinema of Riti Pan, uh, Everything Has a Soul, which uh, came out just this year with Rutgers University Press. Our second panelist, Anna Amelina Damley, is Associate Professor in French at Durham University. Her research interests reside in questions of embodiment, affect, gender, sexuality, and race in contemporary French Francophone literature and philosophy. Amelina is the author of The Becoming of the Body, Contemporary Women's Writing in French, which came out with Edinburgh University Press in 2014, and has co-edited with Jill Rye three books on 21st century women's writing in French, 
Amelina is currently working on a monograph and the politics of consumption in Francophone Mauritian author Ananda Devi's writing and a cross-cultural project on contemporary narratives of birth. Our third panelist, Natalie Edwards, is Professor of French and Deputy Dean for Research in the Faculty of Arts at the University of Adelaide. She specialises in contemporary literature in French, especially women's writing, multilingual writing and transnational writing. Her most recent book is Multilingual Life Writing by French and Francophone Women, Translingual Selves, which came out with Routledge in 2020. She's currently working with Chris Hogarth on a project funded by the Australian Research Council on French migrant writing to Australia. Welcome everybody. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna pass over to Antonia. Antonia. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, and once again, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your day um, to talk uh, with me about my new book, um, which you can see here. Um, so it was published last month um, by Liverpool University Press. And as Joe said, I'm going to give a brief overview of some of the main ideas and themes of the book, and then we will hear from the three invited speakers about a particular chapter. So I'm just, just going to share my uh, screen with you all. Um, so hopefully you can all see that okay. Brilliant. Uh, so before I get started, just a, a further reminder of the discount. So if you would like to buy the book, you are eligible for a 30% discount. Um, and that is the, um, the voucher code that you need. So the 21st century is an era of globalization and mobility. In an increasingly globalized world, national borders are becoming erased as growing numbers of people from diverse countries and social backgrounds are moving away from their native land, whether by force or through choice. This mobility can take many forms, exile, asylum, forced migration, economic migration, tourism, and travel, to name but a few. In the present moment, we are reminded of the salvation that displacement can bring, as people leave their homes in search of safety in the wake of natural disasters, in the case of Haiti, for instance, and political upheaval and violence, such as those fleeing Taliban rule in Afghanistan. Yet at the same time, migration in its many forms can be isolating and alienating. Communities involved in these different forms of displacement are forced to question where they have come from, where they belong, and what the concept of home really means to them. So it is these questions of belonging, identity, and exile that my new book, published by Liverpool University Press last month, aims to explore. So the book examines how these issues resonate specifically in the Francophone post-colonial context, where the concept of the nation state of France is constantly being reconfigured by the arrival of people from France's former colonies across the world. The book questions how writers, who themselves have been shaped by the French colonial project, engage with these different models of exile and displacement. It asks how women writers, who have long been locked out of these discussions because of their gender, write about their specifically gendered experiences of exile. It draws on work from post-colonial studies, gender studies and autobiographical studies, and continues the research by scholars such as Kate Averis, Isabel Holistouri, Elodie Kahintang, and F. Elizabeth Dahab, and it creates a new analytical framework to incorporate women into the scholarly debate. So my corpus is composed of a wide range of contemporary authors from across the French-speaking world. This wide-reaching corpus has enabled me to investigate how the geographical, historical, and cultural specificities of the former colonies influence the ways in which women undergo exile. I also wanted to put more established writers into dialogue with lesser known voices to encourage discussion and debate about writers who are not yet considered as a part of the Francophone post-colonial canon. So the book studies the work of Kim Lefebvre, whose familial country of origin is Vietnam, Giselle Pino, Guadeloupe, Nina Bouhari, Algeria, Michel Hakudson, Madagascar, Bahani Tadjo, Côte d'Ivoire, and Abla Faroud, Lebanon. But as I, as I explain in the book, the writers have multiple locales of attachment. And so the study questions how they each negotiate their complex identity with their country of origin, with France, and in the case of Fahoud, with Quebec. And in fact, Quebec is not often included in discussions of post-colonial migration, principally because its post-colonial status has fiercely been contested 
Amaral Chanady questions whether we should, and I quote, even talk about post-coloniality in the case of a predominantly white settler society, which is itself seen as a colonizer by the marginalized native peoples, many of whom do not consider themselves as Quebecois or even as Canadians. So my work on Fahoud helps to explore how Quebec's political status provides a different perspective to these discussions. In the book, I argue that current models of exile do not currently fully explain, do not fully explain the situation of the six authors. They do not have a well-defined home and host country. The colonial past of the familiar country of origin has complicated this notion of home. And in the post-colonial present, the authors have been drawn to different locations across the French speaking world. So these women writers can be more accurately defined as privileged cosmopolitan intellectuals. They have a certain degree of freedom in their ability to travel back and forth between different locations. And their identity, which is always in flux, is shaped by their mobility. While cultural scholars such as Homi Baba and Edouard Glisson have celebrated such hybridity and fluidity, the six authors in this study write about the ambiguity of their status as cosmopolitan travelers who live a rootless existence, but struggle to come to terms with their multiple identities. So while ensuring not to trivialize the very real difficulties faced by those whose exile is not a matter of choice, I argue that the six authors also experience the hybridity as both a literal exile and a metaphorical exile which is simultaneously a source of creativity and trauma. So I conclude that post-colonial models of diasporic identity are in fact experienced by the six authors as different forms of metaphorical exile. My use of the term metaphorical exile is informed by David Bevan's ideas, which he advances in Literature and Exile, which was published in 1990. Namely that, and I quote, exile viscerally is difference, otherness. The book also draws on Julia Kristeva's notion of the threefold theory of exile, which she advances in Un Nouveau Titre Intellectuel, Le Dissident, uh, from 1977. And Kristeva argues that women writers can be exiled geographically, but they also undergo exile because of their gender and because of their status as a writer. Engaging with these different ideas, my book shows how genre in both its forms, so thinking about gender and literary genre, enables the writers to reconceptualize categories of mobility. The autofictional mode of writing becomes a liberating space for the authors and a way for them to resolve the multiple personal conflicts that arise from their migration. So how is the book structured? Following an introductory theoretical chapter and a chapter on autofiction as a guiding principle connecting each author and their narratives, the book takes a chronological approach to the text. In this way, it offers a diachronic analysis of recent francophone post-colonial women's writing of exile. Beginning with Lefebvre's art of fictional writing and working through the text in chronological order in terms of publication date has allowed me to test whether the literature of these female Francophone writers reveals some sort of progression in terms of literary innovation and political emancipation. So chapter one, entitled Exile, Auto Fiction and Women's Writing, sets up the comparative approach to the book. It compares and contrasts the ways in which the six authors use writing to work through their identitarian issues provoked by their literal and metaphorical exile. More specifically, it examines the ways in which they engage with theories and concepts of autofiction in order to claim ownership of their life story. Drawing on Serge Dubrovsky's reflections on the genre, which allows for a manipulation of narrative time and form, but maintains the, pact, the autobiographical pact between author, narrator, and protagonist, I argue that through autofiction, the six authors have the freedom to regain control of their difficult situation by fictionalizing particularly painful elements. And reflecting psychoanalytically upon their personal stories enables them to examine the many effects that migration has had on their complex and multiple identities. The second chapter discusses exile and family estrangement in Franco-Vietnamese author Kim Lefebvre's two art of fictional works, Matisse Blanche, which was published in 1989, and Retour à la saison des pluies, which was published a year later in 1990. And we'll hear more about the Fevre and her writing in Leslie's talk shortly. This chapter examines the metissage or the mixed race identity of the narrator Kim. For key post colonial thinkers such as Francois Lyonnais and Francoise Vergès, metissage is a dynamic process of opposition against these static markers of identity. Yet Kim and those around her espouse the French colonial thinking, which equates metissage with inferiority. And Kim considered it, considers it a problematic, disruptive state which causes her geographical and metaphorical exile, both as a child in Vietnam and as an adult in France. 
And I examined the colonial dimensions of Lefebvre's gendered exile within her family to then think about how the, uh, the other authors deconstruct these colonial paradigms. The following chapter investigates Guadeloupean writer Gisele Pino's Les Isles Julia from 1996, a text which has already attracted significant scholarly attention for its insights into exile and gender. And Natalie will speak more about Pino and her work shortly. In this chapter, I study the motives for the Pino family's migration from Guadeloupe to metropolitan France in the 1960s. The chapter is shaped around the question of choice in exile. Analyzing the causal relationship between war and displacement for three generations of Pina women, so the unnamed narrator, her mother Daisy and her grandmother Julia, I argue that their mobility, which arises as a result of male participation in the First and Second World Wars, has complex, long-lasting, and at times even beneficial impacts on the family. Chapter four explores the connections between exile, gender, and sexuality in three of Franco-Algerian writer Nina Bouhari's autofictional narratives, Le Jour du Seisme from 1999, Garçon Manquet from 2000, and Le Mauvaise Pensée from 2005. And Amelina will give her response to these texts shortly. So in this chapter, I analyze the racial, gendered, sexual, and linguistic hybridity of Bouhari's literary heroine, a character which spans the three texts, but in different guises. Hybridity equates to exclusion for her because she is always defined by what she is not. I compare the three texts to investigate how ideas of masculinity, femininity, and sexual desire evolve in Buhari's writing as the narrative persona progresses into adulthood. Chapter five examines the autofiction of Madagascan author Michel Hakutsun. Hakutsun differs considerably to the other five authors in terms of the motives of her exile. She is the only author who was forced to leave her birth on for political reasons because she opposed the authoritarian regime of President Didier Ratsiraka, who was in power at the time. And so here I discuss the, the political implications of her exile as expressed in Jouy au pays, Chronique de Hoto à Madagascar from 2007. The narrative persona describes her experiences of return from Madagascar to France in terms of errance rather than exile. But as I demonstrate, this concept displayed distinct overlaps regarding the sentiments of alienation and otherness they engender. Chapter six argues that a return to the homeland for an individual after living in, uh, amongst the diasporic community does not always equate to a return home. Rather, it can be experienced as a manifestation of exile. This is the case for Nina, the autofictional narrator of Franco Avoyne writer Véronique Tadjo's Loin de mon Père, which was published in 2010. Her return to a country which is no longer home is aggravated by gender issues and by the fact that she continuously views the way of life in Abidjan from a colonial perspective thus revealing the overlaps and disparities between the paradigms of exile and diaspora. The final chapter contributes to the decentering of exilic literature by examining literary uh, expressions of exile in Quebec. In this chapter, I analyze the intersections between aging, education, and exile in Lebanese-born writer Abla Fahoud's autofictional works. Adopting a comparative approach between the texts, I trace exile over different generations of female characters as they are depicted in Tutsa Kujeti from 2015 and Au Grand Soleil Kachi from 2017. I question how women at different life stages who have inev inevitably received differing levels of education experience geographical and metaphorical exile as a form of estrangement. So autofiction, a female francophone aesthetic of exile, thus reconceptualizes female experiences of exile providing a critique of post-colonial discourse which celebrates hybridity and mobility. The disconnection and psychic dissonance experienced by the writers as a result of their multiple layers of otherness is more closely associated with the paradigm of exile rather than with post-colonial models that celebrate difference as a form of resistance. The book connects gender with the literary genre and reveals how autofiction allows the authors the opportunity to voice their experiences of gender, literal and metaphorical exile on their own terms. Finally, I would like to thank colleagues and, and friends in French studies and beyond, without whom this book would not have been possible. This book originated as my PhD thesis, which I completed at the University of Birmingham, funded by Midlands Four Cities. I would especially like to thank Professor Louise Hardwick, my principal supervisor at Birmingham, for all her guidance and support. I would also like to thank Professor Nikki Hitchcock and Professor Jean-Xavier Hidon for their encouragement and excellent supervision during the PhD. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Charles Fosdick for his invaluable advice, feedback, and guidance. <laughs>
Thank you to everyone at Liverpool University Press for the help with this project, and to colleagues at Birmingham, Bath and Liverpool. Finally, thank you very much to the IMLR and Joe Ford for hosting this event, and to Leslie Barnes, Emily Nadamle, and Natalie Edwards for taking the time to discuss my work with me today. I'm really looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thanks so, very much, Antonia. Stop showing my slides. That's fantastic. Um, brilliant. Um, and it's really, really interesting to have a, an overview of the book and such an impressive range of texts and, and geographical. Uh, geographical settings that you look at. Um, I'm going to pass immediately over then to our to our first panelist, who is uh, Leslie Barnes. Uh, Leslie, thank you, Joe, and um, thank you, um, Antonio, for this invitation. It's it's a pleasure. It's a wonderful idea, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here today, um, helping to launch your new book. Autofiction, a female Francophone aesthetic of exile. So as she suggests in her title, Antonia's book weaves autofiction, gender, aesthetics, and postcoloniality into this study of exile. And she tells us early that, quote, reconceptualization of categories of mobility occurs specifically in women's autofictional writing, helping us to figure exile as a gendered, sexual, racial, and or linguistic otherness. The scope of her study is ambitious, not only in its aim to make visible these tangled and at times obscured threads of exile, but also in its geographic coverage, Vietnam, Guadeloupe, Algeria, Madagascar, Côte d'Ivoire, and Lebanon by way of Quebec. Exile is, as she noted, metaphorical as well as geographical in her analysis, naming a sense of interpersonal and social alienation not necessarily tied to physical displacement, though in the cases she studies, the two go hand in hand. The breadth of Antonia's comparative approach and her privileging of autofiction as a mode of exilic writing allow her to draw parallel, parallels across this wide range of authors, contexts, and histories, underscoring the proximate and indeed disparate ways in which Francophone women's autofiction has confronted exile as source of both conflict and creativity. At Antonia's request, what I will do is dive deep into chapter two's presentation of mixed race identity in colonial Vietnam, or colonial Indochina. This chapter entitled Exile, Métissage and Family Estrangement in Kim Lefebvre's autobiographical narratives underscores the bewildering interplay between nationalistic fervor, familial dishonor, poverty, war, opportunity, and migration in the making of one woman's exile. In Antonia's introductory gloss, it's also an outlier of sorts. Kim Lefebvre, who I'm saddened to say passed away uh, just a month ago in Marseille, is or was the oldest and least well-known author outside the academy treated here. She was born in 1935 and raised during the years of colonial rule, then world war, then anti-colonial struggle, than civil division and distrust. Her writing more than that of the others in the study reveals the deep scars of such violence suffered by a country and its people. But perhaps more important for Antonia, the two works studied here, Métis Blanche published in 89 and Retour à la saison des pluies published in 90, quote, remain largely uninfluenced by post-colonial thinking. They reproduce to a certain extent Orientalist paradigms and set up a discussion of how the other authors deconstruct colonial paradigms and work within a new post-colonial framework." End quote. Published 32 years ago and 35 years after the fall of Dien Bien Phu, Métis Blanche traces the final decades of colonial rule in Indochina through the experience of one girl caught between two peoples at war and the two poles of her being, Vietnamese and French. Born to a French father who abandons her and a Vietnamese mother for whom she is the embodiment of a shameful transgression, the narrator's formative years are marked by ambivalence and subject to an existential volatility heralded in the first chapter's title, Errance. The narrator's family who always lived on the lookout relocates regularly, fleeing poverty, the judgment of those around, the fury of war. Early in the novel, when the Viet Minh enter her village to enlist support against the French, her mother hides her in an earthenware jar, 
Her French blood is a betrayal of the nation and a reminder of its subjugation by outsiders. The young narrator left alone in the dark understands suddenly that she is the enemy of her countrymen, the only people she has truly known, the people whose grief she will later share when their homes are destroyed to save them being captured by the French. This image of unwitting enemies shrouded in darkness is a powerful one and speaks volumes about the specific historical context out of which this experience and its telling emerged. Vietnam has spent much, if not most of its history fighting off imperial invasion, wave after wave coming from China, all the while pursuing its own agenda of expansion. The first and second Indochinese wars fought against the French and the Americans respectively are just part of this long and bloody pursuit of national sovereignty and an elusive sense of unity. Indeed, despite the union imposed by colonial rule, as Antonia rightly observes, Indochina was in fact composed of five distinct territories, three of which, Tonkin, Annam, and Kushanxin are today part of Vietnam. This domain originated in the Red River Delta in the north and was built gradually between the 11th and 19th centuries as part of the Nam Thien policy or the march toward the south. The acquisition of lands in the middle section of the country and what the French called Anam were spoils from the Champa kingdom conquered in the 15th century. While the Mekong Delta region, Cochinchine for the French or Kampuchea Krom for the Cambodians was wrested from the Khmer empire in the 17th century. Ethnically, it's been a story of forced assimilation and equally, equally violent exclusion by the king majority. Politically, and this is especially true of the 20th century, it's been one of a single-minded quest for autonomy. This is an important context, I think, for our understanding of the relationship between the narrator's identity and the moments of internal and external conflict that punctuate both Métis Blanche and Retour à la saison des pluies. She's born into a fiercely nationalist family her uncle a Vietnamese soldier from 1941 and who held regular meetings outside Hanoi in the forests of Tuyen Quang. It's worth lingering briefly on this reference to Tuyen Quang where the military base was tied to a disproportionate number of mixed race children. In her study of these morally abandoned children and the state sponsored programs that aims, aimed to crystallize their Frenchness, Christina Firpo reminds us that Tuyen Quang was known as one of Indochina's international provinces because of the many French legionnaires and their Vietnamese mistresses. Legionnaires in Douglas Porch's estimation were hardly models of the elite and highly disciplined branch of the French military, but rather, quote, a mongrel unit recruited among the scrapings of humanity, perhaps even among the criminal classes, but also containing a fairly sizable contingent of gentlemen rankers who fled into the legion to escape a dark past or out of a desire for adventure, end quote. Alongside their mistresses, the legionnaires were also the subject of Vu Cham Phung's scathing satire. Uh, in Vietnamese, Ki Nghe Lai Te, or The Industry of Marrying Europeans, published in Hanoi in 1934, the year before Kim was born. For Vu Cham Phung, it wasn't just the simple nationalist idea that Vietnamese morals had been perverted through colonial contact and its blood sullied by these mongrel Lotharios, Though this was true in part, the industry of marrying Europeans also insisted on the impoverishment of traditional Vietnamese society independent of colonial contact. He mocked the social conditions and moral orders that historically disadvantaged women and people of certain classes, things like the three obediences and four virtues of Confucianism, for example, the relative lack of education for women and the ongoing political inequality most clearly represented by the lack of universal suffrage, all issues that were taken up by the Vietnamese nationalist movement in the 1930s, but that clearly lingered into the middle of the century and beyond. Lefebvre's narratives, as Antonius' analysis demonstrates, frame colonial presence as poison, and, as poison and cure, as that which leads to the narrator's estrangement from her family and from her homeland, and paves the way for her education her autonomy and her ultimate departure for France. But they also expose the violent hypocrisies of traditional Vietnamese society and its prejudices, giving voice to those who because of their mixed race were vilified, forsaken by the nation and left 
largely out of its historical record. This moment is perhaps most pronounced in Retour, when the narrator returns to Vietnam only to discover that for her family, she is the one who abandoned them. Lefebvre's narratives echo Vu Chom Fung's searing critique and presage Firpo's history of this forgotten population of Métis children in colonial and post-colonial Vietnam, bringing to life the author's vivid, if not entirely reliable, memory of life as a Métis in French Indochina, the triple handicap of being woman, biracial, and illegitimate, the sexual allure for Vietnamese men of this aberrant white métissage and the protection provided by French orphanages where many mixed race children forcibly removed from their families or abandoned in the narrator's case were assimilated to French culture. Alongside um, books like Kin Witten's The Unwanted, the memoir of a young boy born to an American father and a Vietnamese mother published in America in 2008, Lefebvre's accounts expose the institutional and interpersonal hostility that shaped generations of young children in Vietnam, generations born to and treated as the enemy. It centers the story on them, teasing out these different fibers that are part of the Vietnamese ethnic tapestry. Kim Lefebvre, as Antonia argues, does not use métissage to celebrate a cultural, linguistic, or nat nat national hybridity. Instead, she insists on these different threads, Vietnamese and French, with which she is woven or tissé. They are separate and distinct in her narratives, leading her narrator to feel everywhere othered, out of place, even in the brief moments of synthesis between the two poles of her identity. We might say that they must remain separate so as to remain visible, to link the past to the present, France to Vietnam, and to make visible a history that was for many years occluded in the name of Vietnamese nationalist and French assimilationist politics. So with that, um, Antonia, I would like to congratulate you on your exciting new book and to thank you uh, again for the invitation to return to these themes and to contribute to this event. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Leslie, for such a rich intervention. Um, and, uh, of course, getting getting away, uh, as, as Antonia writes in her book, getting away from that kind of simplistic celebration of difference um, and towards an understanding of the, the complexities of, of French colonialism. I'm struck by how each of these chapters gives us a sense of, and, and the range of it gives us a sense of access to so many different uh, histories. And um, that very much came across in, in your talk, Leslie. So thank you very much for that. I'm gonna hand over now to Amelina Damley. Amelina. Thank you, Joe. Um, well, likewise, I'm, I'm delighted to, to have been asked to talk about Antonia's new monograph. Um, I've come into contact with Antonia's research over the past several years at, at a number of events um, at the Center for Contemporary Women's Writing here as we virtually are at the IMLR, um, at Women in French and, and elsewhere. And it's always been um, an absolute pleasure. And it's also been very evident to me in listening to her present her fascinating research, but also in, in remarking some of the, the, the excellent collaborative um, work that she referred to earlier, that Antonia represents an, an, an important and a distinctive emerging scholarly voice within contemporary women's writing um, and, and as well within Francophone post-colonial studies. So I was thrilled to receive um, a copy of this wonderful book. Um, I found it to be a hugely impressive, revealing, poised um, and trenchant piece of writing um, that holds its reader beautifully in charting across the terrain of contemporary Francophone women's writing, the experiences and aesthetics of exile. The relevance, indeed the urgency to reflect again on notions, figurations, stories of exile as a way to think through contemporary forms of otherness at the intersection of race, language, gender and sexuality really cannot be overstated. As Antonia reminds us in the opening pages of the book, exile and this is a quotation, exile is not only a unique and complex mode of migration, but also a constellation of knowledge that shifts 
depending on geographical position, social status, gender, age, and ethnicity. And as the title of this monograph makes plain, as Antonio and Leslie have already um, commented on, autofiction occupies a central place in Antonia's readings, offering her six authors a means of grappling with difficult, often traumatic experiences, and crucially offering a form through which to inscribe the contemporary flux of in-between embodied exilic experience. So I'm going to um, talk about Antonia's chapter on Nina Bourawi. Um, Bourawi's prolific body of life writing, I think, lends itself wonderfully to the overarching concerns of Antonia's book. Born to an Algerian father and a French mother, against the backdrop of violent French-Algerian conflict, Bourawi's distinctive lyrical autofictional writing has brought her to prominence on the French literary scene and among scholars as well as popular readers. She is well known for her poignant depictions of migration, displacement and exile and her anguished evocations of a body cleaved into two parts, ever at war with one another. Antonia opens her reflection on Bourawi's writing with a quotation from her most celebrated work, Garçon Monkey. Um, and it is a quotation that immediately signals um, the four problems of Nina Bourawi, which is the title of Antonia's chapter. It's a quotation that discloses the exilic experience of her, of her narrator, Nina, at the crossroads of national and gendered identity. Tous les matins, je vérifie mon identité. J'ai quatre problèmes, française, algérienne, fille, garçon. So this is one of the most oft cited parts of Bourawi's writing. And yet here and throughout the chapter, Antonia fluently dialogues with existing interpretations while bringing out further layers of nuance and sensitivity in her own readings. Patiently unpicking Nina's self-interrogation, Antonia underscores that the four problems she confronts relates not only to questions to, of national and gendered identity, but also to interlocking issues of sexual and linguistic identity. The adverbial time phrase, tous les matins, suggests a repetition over time to Nina's questioning, representative of Bourawi's looping autofictional style a style evocative of traumatic returns. Meanwhile, the problème reveal Nina's sense of conflict with regard to her fluctuating identity, a socialized impetus on the one hand to fit into labels, and on the other hand, her frustration with the codified nature of these categories. Finally, the order in which Nina states her four problems, her four problems, Française, Algérienne, fille, garçon, uh, Antonia argues, demonstrates an association between Algeria and masculinity and France and femininity, an association that recurs in Bourawi's writing and that risks becoming complicit in the reification of reductive connections between nationhood and gender. In many ways, Antonia shows us Bourawi's expressions of the exilic self correspond to Homi Baba's conceptualizations of hybridity, which she has previously unpacked in her excellent theoretically assured introductory chapter. As she goes on to analyze in detail in this chapter, in Bourawi's writing, national identity emerges in the space in between Algerian and French spaces just as gendered identity becomes articulated at the nexus of masculinity and femininity. However, Bourawi's writing also creates room for contestation and modulation of Baba's celebratory stance on hybridity. As Antonia writes, whereas Baba argues that hybridity is a positive model of empowerment that is predicated on inclusion, for Bourawi's protagonist, hybridity equates to exclusion. She does not feel both French and Algerian, both masculine and feminine, but rather none of these four identitarian labels. She is always defined by that which she is not, which engenders a sense of lack and malaise 
gendered, national, sexual, and linguistic hybridity thus provoke in Burrowi's literary heroine an extreme sense of exclusion and alienation, mirrored by the author's personal preoccupation with these themes. In the searching close analysis that this chapter consists of, Antonia reads Garçon Manqué alongside the relatively lesser studied Le Jour du Séisme, which is a short text that narrates the rootless wandering and feelings of loss, displacement and exile of a young girl following the 1980 earthquake in Northern Algeria. And the final text to make up Antonia's Bouhawian triumvirate is the prize winning Mes Mauvaises Pensées, an experimental work that charts the narrator's ongoing psychotherapeutic process and collates memories and reflections that crisscross through time and the geographical spaces of France and Algeria in piecing together the narrator's multifaceted self. Throughout Antonia's probing explorations of Bouhawi's articulations of exile, racial, gendered, linguistic, sexual, are endlessly attentive to textual detail to autofictional possibility, and they are illuminating in the new insights that they bring to her work. Particularly impressive, considering the vast geographical and cultural scope of this monograph, are Antonia's readings of Bouhawi's writing against the backdrop of the Algerian War of Independence, the ramifications of the 1980 earthquake, the political turmoil of the Décennie Noire, which are all meticulously informed and beautifully contextualized alienation, loss, abandonment, displacement. These lie at the heart of Bouhawi's autofictional portrayals of a narrator who is, in Antonio's words, haunted by a bloody history. There are glimpses nonetheless of liberation. As Antonio writes, exile constitutes a negotiation between trauma and freedom because although it undoubtedly disrupts the stability of the narrator's life, it also simultaneously broadens her horizons and acts as a catalyst for personal exploration for her. And yet, ultimately, Antonia argues after Said that the achievements of exile are always undermined by something that is left behind. For Bouhawi, this may be the remnants of a certain complicity, one that we glimpsed in the opening quotation the complicity that is condemned to reiterate the binaries it seeks to evade. Caught between trauma and freedom, then, Bouhawi's autofictional narratives of exile are, as this beautifully composed and thought-provoking chapter shows, are themselves to be found somewhere in a space between disjointed, restless, exilic, wondrous. So I'd also like to congratulate Antonia um, on this wonderful monograph, which I've, I've tremendously enjoyed reading. It's made me think in, 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 in altogether new ways. Um, and, to, and to thank her and, um, and Joe for inviting me to speak to, today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amelina. And you really, I think, reveal the, you know, the traps of, of binary thinking but also the traps of some of the solutions that are proposed to, to that binary thinking and perhaps a, a need to think in a more open-ended way uh, about uh, uh, Bourdieu's work and its relation to, to the multiple histories it engages with. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to pass straight on to uh, Natalie Edwards. Natalie. Thank you, Joe. I'm also delighted to be here with all of you this evening as we launch Antonia's book. I haven't seen the physical book yet. It hasn't arrived down here in Australia, but I very much enjoyed reading it. It is beautifully written with an admirable clarity of expression and argument. I've actually been involved with this book for quite some time, it feels like now, and I've seen it evolve through the various stages of production and of reflection, I think, as well. If I'm not mistaken, I first met you, Antonia, when you were writing your PhD thesis. And I'm pretty sure it was at the IMLR that I met you, in fact. And I would like to give a quick shout out to the IMLR because they have been an, an anchor for me, a scholarly home as I have moved around. And I know that the particular, in particular, the Centre for Women, Contemporary Women's Writing has been that for, for many people. 
I think it does a tremendous um, writing. And I think um, it's great to see them doing activities like this tonight. When I first learned about Antonia's manuscript, I was struck by its broad, inclusive framework that allows ample scope for rich and interesting comparisons. Such a framework fits neatly into the current trend of comparing across areas of the Francosphere, thus moving away from studies of specific national literatures. This allows us to probe the multiple encounters that have forged national and transnational identities in the present time, which Antonia does with aplomb. Her six writers each problematize current understandings of exile, migration, and belonging. Her emphasis on gender leads to much needed understanding of the effects of migration, both forced and unforced, upon women. Organizing the manuscript by writer rather than by theme allows for in-depth, close reading of individual voices and enables comparison often between two or three works by each writer. And the writer I'm going to speak to this evening is Giselle Pinot, the subject of Antonia's third chapter. Pinot hails from Guadeloupe, which was colonized by France in 1635 and became a DOM, a département d'outre-mer, and more recently a DROM, a département région d'outre-mer. I've been teaching and researching Pinot's work for many years now, and I'm delighted to see her work getting more attention in French studies curricula and scholarship. As Antonia points out, Pinot has achieved fame in the Caribbean, but her works have only more recently gained attention in Europe. As Antonia also identifies, Pinot still considers herself to be at the margins of the male-dominated Francophone Caribbean literary scene, as you probably right. In Antonia's chapter, she focuses on one of Pinot's most complex texts, L'Exil selon Julia. She contextualizes her argument in terms of the large-scale migration from the French Antilles to metropolitan France. During the First and Second World Wars, soldiers were recruited from France's colonies, and after the Second World War, were encouraged to settle in France to help rebuild the country. In this partially autobiographical text, Pinot recounts the effects of such a displacement on successive generations of one Caribbean family, members of which participated in the French military. The narrative structure is complex since the text moves between, Af between Africa, the Caribbean and Europe. As Antonia writes, it reflects the narrator's migratory patterns through its ruptures and dislocations. Although the family moves due to the male activity of military participation, two male characters fight for France and the family thus relocates to France after the war. This text foregrounds the impact of this migration on its female characters. As Antonia writes, L'Exil selon Julia is indeed a retrospective account of her family history, but Pino simultaneously uses the textual space to explain how the memory of her family's displacements has had important resonances for her own exile, thus complicating the essence of autobiographical writing. Antonia's chapter is meticulously researched as she brings to bear theories taken from post-colonial studies, migration studies, and autobiographical studies on Pino's work. This chapter is predicated on an interpretation of Pino's work as a tale of constant displacement. Antonia cites an array of literary critics who have engaged with Pino's text, which are probably the best known and most studied of her corpus. L'Exil Salon Julia has indeed attracted significant critical attention for its insights into exile and gender. Nevertheless, Antonia deftly weaves this criticism into a new approach to Pino's work. This chapter offers an innovative reading of L'Exil selon Julia by analyzing the connections between war and displacement for the female members of the Pino family. Antonia couches her study in terms of discourses of displacement, which typically categorize exile according to people's motives for departure, distinguishing between voluntary and involuntary migration. Nevertheless, as Antonia shows, L'exil selon Julia exposes the fraught distinction between voluntary and involuntary exile, which Kate Averis names a false dichotomy. As questions of will and agency, autonomy and independence come to bear on each character's exile. While the family chooses to migrate to France, while they have moved back and forth between Europe and Africa, and while they enjoy a degree of privilege, the female members of Pinot's family experience displacement that is firmly controlled by their husbands and fathers within the patriarchal family. The women of different generations 
must thus learn to negotiate their identity within this space of exile, which is hardly a voluntary migration. By reading the text through this specific lens, Antonia's chapter sheds new lights on Pino's work, as well as on understandings of the, com the impact of war and migration on women. Her reading of L'Exil selon Julia reveals the complex role of war in exile and displacement by pointing to the many indirect consequences of warfare upon Caribbean migration to France during the 20th century. She highlights the psychological exile of soldiers and the women who accompany them because it forces them to engage with a new language and culture, isolating them when they struggle to adapt. Antonia argues that the impact of migration upon the three women is distinct, but overlap in meaningful ways. Whereas Julia of the title dies with her identity firmly Caribbean, the text finishes with an openness to future patterns of identity. As Antonia writes, throughout her experiences of exile, by engaging with the Creole heritage that Julia has imparted, the narrator is ultimately able to become increasingly resilient to racial discrimination and forge her own Creole feminine identity. Congratulations, Antonia, on the book. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to celebrate it with you. And I wish it every success. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Natalie. Again, such a rich intervention. <clears throat> and um, opening up and showing how Antonia is opening up those neglected histories and, and inflecting those histories uh, through the, the neglected voices of, of women writers. So thank you very much indeed. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor to questions. If you have a question, you can feel free to, to raise your digital hand. Um, you can post in the chat and we'll invite you to, to come on live and ask a question. If you prefer to remain anonymous, then you can direct your question to me and I'll, I'll, I'll then ask your question to, to Antonio or indeed to the panelists. I just, before we open up for questions, I just wanted to go back to Antonia and see, Antonia, if you'd like to briefly respond to the uh, three readings of your, of your book. Antonia. Thank you. Um, yes, I would like to thank um, very much Leslie, um, Amelina and, um, and Natalie um, for those uh, really wonderful um, observations and, and comments um, about the book. It's, 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 it's really touching, so thank you very much. Um, Leslie, I was particularly struck by your very de detailed historicization of the, the text, thinking about colonial uh, Indochina and thinking about how that um, the historical context obviously played a huge part in um, these th feelings of, of isolation and alienation um, for mixed race um, peoples of mixed race of, of mixed um, kind of French and, and colonial um, that, that were brought up in that particular time. Um, Amelina, um, I very much liked how you thought about kind of um, the fact that of exile in terms of trauma, but also um, focusing on the liberation and, and kind of the more positive, optimistic um, uh, outcomes of this as well. So in the text, it's not it's not just a, a very negative kind of reading of, of this trauma um, that is obviously very hist historically based, um, but thinking about exile in terms of, of liberation, both for, for women uh, in terms of, of liberation for women, but also liberation from particularly difficult situations from, from violence and so on. Um, and Natalie, thank you very much for, for your comments um, about thinking about the, the, the links between war and displacement for, for the Pino characters. Um, I think that was something that was a, a kind of a thread that I found um, during the, the, the thesis and the writing the book throughout all the texts, but it, it particularly seemed um, really striking in Les Isles and Julia just how much that that the Pino family's ex exile was impacted by by war, both in terms of of the the male family's participation in the first and the second world war, um, but also in a more metaphorical sense. So I, in the book, I talk about um, the narrator kind of fighting her own war against racism um, and, and thinking about how how she experiences racism in the classroom as part of her own war almost. Um, so so that was something that's that really struck me. So, so thank you very much to all three speakers for, um, for your uh, very kind words and for, for agreeing to speak today. Thanks so much, Antonio, and thanks again to, uh, to, to Amelina, Natalie and, and Leslie. Um, perhaps I could, I could get us started with, with a question. And um, I, it's, it's a question I, I was, I guess I was wondering, I think you broached this in, in the introduction to the book, Antonio. And it's when you, in particular, when you mention uh, what corpus you're, you're looking at and how kind of um, 
I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if you use this term or not, but how exceptional these writers are or how available they are and in, in terms of um, in terms of how prominent they are in a particular corpus or um, what scholarship has done with these writers in the past. My, my question is about the communities that you spoke about at the start, so the, 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 the social element and the relationship of literature to the social. And it's not a question I have an answer to, so... It's, it's a little bit cruel, perhaps, but it's a question that I'm constantly re- trying to reckon with, which is to say, um, can we, how, how do we resolve this tension between literary representation and the everyday? How do we resolve this, this question, uh, uh, this, this tension between, you know, the communities you mentioned there at the start, the communities of migrants uh, in society and uh, these writers? And I wonder, I wonder whether autofiction has something to do with it in, in terms of the mode in which these writers are writing. Does that equip them to do different things with their texts that you might not otherwise be able to do with a, a standard kind of fi- fiction? Um, and then related to that, sorry, it's a, a string of questions really, related to that, who's reading these texts? Who are they for? So, um, yeah, they're, they're my questions. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you very much, Joe. As you said, um, very interesting questions to start off this, the discussion. Um, in terms of kind of the literary representation in the everyday, um, that's a great question. And um, I think that's something that I've definitely tried to do in the book is to um, think about the positionality of the uh, six authors. Um, and as I explained in the presentation, they are very, their experiences are very different to the experiences of um, those of, of ordinary people, if you like, of, of people who are um, in these situations. So I, I've been very careful to try to say that these are not representative of all people who experience these, these issues. Um, they've experienced their own exile in, in different ways and they write about it. Um, and I think that literature is a way of raising awareness of some of these issues um, and, and talking about them in, in, a, in a literary context. Um, and by, by sharing the, the kind of the, the range of experiences that different people can have um, and, and potential solutions to some of these to these issues, while at the same time obviously creating that distance between um, kind of these, these communities that, that do experience these, these very real difficulties and the authors themselves. And, and as you suggested, I do think that autofiction has um, a part to play there because it's very much that that they are aware of their position as authors and so that they can they can play with with our expectations if you like they can play with what we think about them and what we think about their exile um and um so they're not they're not necessarily just explaining very directly what happened to them but they are very much aware of of kind of controlling and manipulating almost um, readers in in that particular sense so so i think that that is is definitely um one one possibility of of kind of portraying the, the social element whilst also creating more of a distance as well um, and in answer to your second question, who is reading these texts? Um, I think it very much depends on the different authors. Um, as you, uh, as um, I think it was Leslie who mentioned, um, Kim Lefebvre is perhaps the, the most uh, less, she's not the most well known, she's the most, at least known really of the corpus. Um, her writing is perhaps, well, I think I think all of the writing obviously is, is perhaps for a French audience, um, kind of a French um well educated audience, a French audience that that appreciates these these topics, these issues. Um, but then also you have some of the authors do play with language in particular ways. So that obviously brings into question of um, kind of the use of, of different languages and, and indi- indigenous languages. So for instance, Gisele Pino does use some Creole in her texts. Um, sometimes it's translated, sometimes it isn't translated. So that brings up the question as, as to um, is she specifically addressing a, a, a Creole speaking audience um, or is she trying to do something different with, with language, um, whereas somebody like Michelle Rekordson, she did very much plays with language in, in Malagasy, the um, indigenous language in, in um, Madagascar, which she speaks, and, and that was a language which she was brought up in. Um, she uses that language in the text, but then immediately translates it into French. So um, again, we've kind of got this play between who is who is the audience? Is it a strictly speaking French audience? Is it a, is it a different audience? So um, so I think it is very specific to the particular authors and that they use language in different ways to, um, to kind of bring about those uh, the cultural specificities of the text themselves. Thanks, Antonio. It's fascinating to think about how 
you know, translation functions in that setting as well in terms of multilingualism and then presenting that to a, a metropolitan French audience. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, I see, Amelina, um, you, have a, you have a question. Amelina. Yeah, if I may. Um, so I was just struck by, you know, what, one of the, I think something that, that all three of us commented on was, was just the, the astonishing breadth, transnational breadth of, of your corpus, Antonia, and, um, you know, how impressively you moved across um, locations and cultures. And um, I just wondered if, if you could say a little bit about your experience of, of bringing these authors together and, and what challenges you faced in doing that. And, and whether there were other authors that, that you would have liked to have perhaps included that, that, that didn't, didn't quite make, um, to make it into the book. Uh, great question. Thank you so much, Emelina. Um, yeah, I mean, the transnational element was something that I really wanted to focus on um, because I wanted to see how these different women writers from across the Francophone world experience exile and, and kind of the, the impacts of these very specific cultural and political elements of that. Um, as I explained in the presentation, the book originated from my PhD thesis. And in my PhD thesis, I had four authors. So I looked at uh, Giselle Pino, Nina Bohari, Kim Lefebvre, and Veronique Dadio. Um, and it was in my, and in the conclusion to my thesis, I suggested ways of expanding the research. Um, and I, I suggested that, that it would be really interesting to see how um, the um, kind of how other elements, other parts of the Francophone world deal with these issues and, and other authors too. And it was in my Viva, um, and it was um, Charles Fosdick, who was my external examiner. Um, and he suggested that I actually did what I said I was going to do in the conclusion, which was to expand the corpus. Um, and to think about how these, these differences um, really play out in the text. Um, so I thought about it and I thought that that would be a really good idea in terms of the book project, um, to have a, a more stronger book project and to, to kind of see how these, these differences um, come about. So um, when I was putting together the book proposal, it was then that I had to think about how I was going to extend the corpus and, and which authors I was going to include. Um, and I came across Michelle Hakudson's work, um, and I thought that that was, would be a really good fit. Um, and uh, also thinking about Madagascar, which obviously isn't really, isn't really well represented in Francophone postcolonial studies. So I thought that that could be um, a good option, and, and that, that seemed to fit really well. Um, and then I, I was kind of struggling in terms of, of kind of which authors would be best suited to think about the kind of the element from Quebec because I, I wanted to try to include Quebec because I thought that it did have this very different um, kind of political implication and I, I thought that would be really interesting. Um, and it was then that I came across Abla Fahoud's work and uh, Fahoud is mostly well known for her novel, her 1998 novel, Le Bonheur à la Coglissante, um, and that's her most well known text. But that didn't really fit the corpus because it, it's not strictly speaking auto fictional. It's more kind of um, there are some bio fictional elements and it's, it's kind of thinking about her mother, but not necessarily her. So I, I didn't really think that that would would fit. Um, but then it was then that I came up. I just came across when I was living in France, some of uh, her other texts, um, the Tout Celle Que J'étais and Au Grand Soleil Caché Rufi. And I, I, I found them and I thought this is perfect. This is just what, what I needed for, for the book. Um, and they haven't really been analysed in much detail. I don't think they've been analysed at all, actually, um, because they're, they're quite new. So um, 2015 and into 2017 was when they were published. Um, and so they, they kind of fit, fit, fit really well. Um, so sorry, that's a bit of a, a long winded answer to your question. But um, I hope kind of that explains some of the, the thought process behind uh, putting together the corpus. Thanks very much, Antonia. And thanks, Amelina, for your question. Um, be before I open up, actually, I, I did want to just go back to, to perhaps Natalie and Leslie, in case in case you had any questions that you want to ask before we before we open things up to the to the audience. Joe, I, I don't think I do myself, but I think there was something else in the chat there. There's some. Yeah. I've spotted Miriam. one in the chat. Yeah. Uh, so this is Mir uh, Miriam Gordon. It, it sounds like you you have to come face to face, Miriam. Are you there? Uh, yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, this has been a very fascinating discussion. Um, so um, I'll reiterate my question on the chat. Um, uh, so it's to do with, um, is there a greater willingness in, have, in, as you've done this monograph, have you experienced a greater willingness amongst female Francophone writers to explore the issue of exile and uh, migration and mobility? 
than male francophone writers. Uh, the reason I um, asked this, um, I completed my master's a year ago and my area of research was in uh, and around uh, the francophone Caribbean um, uh, lit literature. And I was working with both male and female authors, one of which was Giselle Pinault's L'Exil Salon Julia. And uh, my observation was that um, the two male authors, which were Patrick Chamasso and Alfred Alexandre, they wrote very much uh, within Martinique. Uh, so the characters didn't go beyond Martinique and it was about their place, their, uh, the sense of belonging within the island. The two female authors, which were Zizel Pino and Maurice Conde, they had characters that moved in and out of the islands. Uh, so I was wondering if, there, it, if it's part of a greater tendency uh, where female authors um, uh, like to write away or write from different places and, not and tackle this issue more than male francophone writers. Uh, thanks so much, Miriam. That's a really good question. And your project sounds really interesting as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that there's definitely a, a link there between gender and, and mobility. Um, and it's something that Kate Averis and Isabel hollis Torrey note in their introduction to their um, edited volume. They, they mention how um, kind of there's, there's this increased number, really, of, of kind of fictional texts that deal with these issues. But then there's not necessarily the scholarship that, that goes with it. So the kind of there is a, a gap there. Um, I think particularly in terms of, of of, um, narratives of return, I saw that as, as more of a male um, dominated field. So kind of thinking about returning from exile. So thinking about um, Aimé Césaire, for instance, um, and his work, or um, Daniel Laferrière and, and, and his autobiographical writing about returning from exile. So perhaps that's more of a, a masculine fo focus and um, perhaps a, and these kind of fictional works of, of exile, of, of going away from, from different islands, particularly from the Caribbean, is perhaps more, more feminine as well. Um, but it's certainly, yeah, a, a kind of a very gendered um, aspect to that. So thank you very much, Mary. Thank you very much. Sorry, so I've got one question in the chat, uh, which has come directly to me, which I'll just read. Uh, Antonia, and then uh, I've got a hand up from, from Gordler. So I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, Gordler, if you don't mind. So this is a question um, uh, from someone who can't turn their microphone on. Um, and I'm just trying to expand the name. So this is from Fatma Masood, um, Antonia. Um, so um, as it was brought up in the first question, I'm interested in your definition of autofiction in your analysis. Do you see that by using autofiction as a lens uh, uh, to, to relabel the generic identity of the texts, do you use autofiction? Do you see that by using autofiction as a lens to relabel the generic identity of the text, so in other words, probing into the unresolved debate of autofiction being a genre and or technique, or is it more of merely an affordance that facilitates examination of the exilic experiences of your writers? And if so, what are some of the literary properties, elements, or markers that highlight autofictional manifestation in your critique of those texts? Thanks. Is, is, that, is that clear to you, Anthony? Yeah, I think I understand the question. Thanks so much uh, for that question. Um, so in the um, first chapter, um, which is where I look at um, kind of autobiography as a, an autofiction as a, as a genre, um, I think about how um, autobiography, kind of the, the, the conventional uh, understandings, understandings of autobiography are not necessarily uh, appropriate for post-colonial writing, particularly because of um, elements of trauma and, and kind of the elements of the, the collective. So um, I'm looking for kind of a different model of autobiography, of autobiographical writing, which would perhaps be best suited for these particular texts. Um, and I, I use um, autofiction in, in terms of, of how Serge Dubrovsky defined the, the genre. So he talks about how um, autofictional texts, they do contain, they do retain 
this the the autobiographical pact between the author and narrator and the protagonist but they are much more um creative with the narrative form there's flashbacks and flash forwards um there are kind of different characters that come in that aren't necessarily related to um to the, the main character um and i see that in in these six texts I, I see that these these six authors um they do use this particular um kind of narrative framing um and i, I explain in the, in the particular chapter how each of these texts uh, negotiates that so just to give an example um Les Lise de la Julia by Gilles Pinot um so in the epigraph of the text um Pinot very very clearly notes how um there's kind of a slippage between fact and fiction and that kind of sets up my reading of of Les Lise de la Julia so it's thinking about that that she is very much aware that she she's not giving the whole truth because what is autobiographical truth it's that, it's that very slippery notion um so that it's very clearly from the epigraph there's kind of a distancing between that and that continues throughout the text for example um the text is called Lexi Sonna Julia so exile according to Julia Julia being the narrator's um grandmother so it's not actually her own exile that's been foregrounded in the text it's her grandmother's um so that's again another distancing between um the narrator and kind of this autobiographical truth um so I hope that that helps to answer the question thanks very much Antonia and and thank you for your question Fatma um good luck Sorry, struggling with the technology, but yes, here I am. Uh, so thank you so much. That's been really, really fascinating. Wonderful talk, um, or talks, really. Um, I have a question relating to the idea or the, 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 the concept of exile and its relation to agency. Um, when you think about exile, uh, you always think with it the place from which you are exiled. So you, it's, it's kind of... Uh, backward move there you know you're looking looking backwards um whereas i think and, and i i'd like to hear more about your writer's relationship between that backward looking and the looking forward the agency to shape your experience of uh alienation uh, uh or um uh displacement um the reason I'm asking is that um, I'm uh, working on similar texts, I think, in German language writing. And very often what I find is that people use translingual and multilingual um, strategies in order to express that kind of agency and in order to shape their, not, not only express their displace displacement, but also to kind of shape a new self-confident form of being different in, a, in an environment, environment where they perhaps are perceived as, as different. Is the same happening in, in the text that you were studying? Uh, thank you very much, Godel. That's a, a fascinating question. Um, I think the authors are very much bound within these the kind of the colonial frameworks um, of of kind of the, the francophone post-colonial world. So in terms of of, of the kind of the, the place where they're exiled to, um, that's normally France, um, apart from um, Quebec in the case of um, Abla Fahoud. Um, but that's obviously has to do with the very colonial frameworks in which they're working. The fact that they were um, their familiar background was was from former colonies, so it was kind of natural almost that they went to to, to the motherland. Um, and it's certainly really interesting in in terms of kind of creating a new self, kind of a, a more confident um, self um, in which you can kind of shed almost the, the kind of the um, the baggage that that belonged in, in kind of the, the country of origin and kind of create this, this new sense of identity and new sense of belonging. Um, I think that's the case for, for some of the authors, definitely. Um, thinking about Nina Bukhari, for instance, so she has never returned to Algeria um, since she left. Um, and although Algeria obviously is a very important part of her identity and it's a very important part of, of her narratives, most of the text she writes around Algeria, even those that aren't also fictional. Um, for instance, her, uh, she's published a, a novel very recently, I think it was last month, called Satisfaction, Satisfaction and um, it's not autobiographical or autofictional, but it is about Algeria. Um, so you can see that it, it does have a very important um, place um, in, in, in her identity, um, but she's never gone back. So 
I think it's a case of kind of she's she's moved on with her life. She's um, kind of she's accepted her, her homosexuality, which she didn't necessarily accept when she was younger. Um, and she's created kind of a, a, a more positive and, and, and kind of a different self and, and doesn't look back. Um, so I think that's definitely the case with, with some of them. Uh, some of the authors that I, that I, that I look at in, in the book, um, whether it's necessarily true for all of them, I, I wouldn't necessarily say so. But, but certainly there are there are some um, authors that, that do definitely fit, fit within that framework. Thank you. Thanks, Antonia, and thanks, Godla, for your question. Uh, we've got another hand up from Amina. Amina. Yes, please. Thank you so much. And congrats, Antonia, for your brilliant Thank you. <laughs> it was very really nice to, to hear all the stimulating talks. So my question for you, Antonia, is um, in light of the productions of the authors you engage with, do you think that the representation of exile reveals also a place in which authors reproduce the exact colonial tropes or paradigms that the post-colonial voice is expected to challenge and resist? Thank you. Um, I think, again, it depends for the different authors. I think, um, as Leslie outlined, um, that, that Kim Lefebvre perhaps is the author that works most prominently within those colonial frameworks. I think that's partly because of her upbringing. So she was born in that, in that particular environment. So um, it was almost nat natural almost that she kind of espoused that, that French colonial thinking that, that equated metissage and the mixed race identity with inferiority and didn't see that as something that could be empowering and, and could be liberating. Um, and then the, the other authors, they do try to, to use these these frameworks in more positive and post-colonial ways, but I think yeah, part of the argument is the fact that these these models are are not as different as perhaps that that, that post-colonial thinking has has led us to believe. So um, there is perhaps this thinking that that there's, there's still a working within these colonial paradigms and how we can break break free from that. Um, but certainly, Kim Lefebvre is the author that works most closely within those, but because of her generational difference um, and because of her familial and cultural background as well. Thanks. Thanks very much, Amina, and, and thanks, Antonia. Uh, I can see another hand up, Claire Launchbury. Hi, Claire. Hello. Is that working? Can you hear me? Hi, Joe. Lovely. Yeah, to great. See you. Thanks, Claire. And um, Antonia, I'm, I've already asked you this question because I didn't think yeah. I was going to be able to be here today. Um, but I got the days wrong for the things that I have to do. Um, it's, it's a kind of related issue around the genre of autofiction. And uh, I was telling Antonia that Claire Louise Bennett has just published an autofiction called um, Checkout 19. And Claire Bennett was in the year above me. And in it, she references her philosophy teacher, who was also my philosophy teacher. And um, a strange central character is this strange person, I think, called Tristan Sakubus, something like that. And in reading through the reviews, and this is the question that I was, or issue that I was reflecting on with Antonia, was that the reviews found the portrayal of these two characters as something quite extraordinary. But I found them, and another friend who was also at college with me, both recognised the people in question. And I was wondering if this is some sort of autofictional uncanny in the Freudian sense of the dissonance of familiarity. So the, uh, and, and also it's a question of readership because we, we then had a back and forth about this, about who, who, who are the intended readers. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm an intended reader. I don't think the people who are actually sort of um, portrayed in, 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 in this are, are, are necessarily meant to be the people who, who, who come along and sort of decipher what's what's true and what's not so so if we are thinking about an autofictional uncanny is that is that kind of something of it that that's going on and, and maybe bringing it back to the text that you've looked at is there a sense in which there's a generic um a generic uncanny which is kind of i don't know constitutive of the genre itself Thanks so much, Claire, and, and it's really good to see you. So thanks for coming. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I, I think it it's it's difficult. It's certainly I think something to do with the readership, I think, and, and who is, who these texts are aimed at. Um, and I think it's it's also difficult in terms when you're thinking about kind of tr 
truth and, and fiction and what, what is autobiographical truth and what is autobiographical fiction. Um, and, and just thinking about my corpus, um, so Vahani Dajjo, for instance, um, has given many interviews and there was an event that I went to and, and heard her speak and she um, said that it's it's not the case that that some of these things happened to me and some of these things didn't happen to me and, and it's not very you can't tell exactly what happened and, and what didn't and what's fiction and, and what isn't fiction um it's more a kind of a general impression of of kind of um a fictionalization and and how the author and the writer come come to terms with that so um i think it's really difficult to kind of define that um and and kind of define what is truth and, and what isn't in these in, in these particular texts and in auto fiction in general um Certainly, in, in terms of, of the, the case that you were thinking of, it, the, the kind of the, the uncanny does seem to have a, a place there in terms of kind of you, you recognizing um, yourself or, or, or the characters of the people that you know in that in that particular text. Um, and obviously, we we don't know what the author's intentions um, are. We will never know what a particular author's intention is by by doing that. But um, it's certainly interesting to think about kind of the, the, the distant dissonance and the difference in in, in in doing in doing such a thing. So um, I don't have a, a kind of a definite um, definitive answer, but I think it's certainly something to do with kind of this difference between autobiographical truth and what is autobiographical truth, and how these notions um, are really slippery and really complex um, and, and can't really easily be pinned down at all. Thank you, Antonia, and thank, thanks, Claire, for your question. Has anyone else got a question? I'm just checking the chat in case I've missed anything. I uh, was just wanting to perhaps go back to this, uh, the, the three panellists as well and see if they, they had any reflections or final reflections. We're, we're coming up to the half past mark where we'll, we'll close the session today, so I just Obviously, audience, if you have any more questions, please feel free to chip in or, or, or the panellists themselves. Maybe, Antonia, you can talk to us about the future of this project. What are you going on to next? What do you hope to do, um, especially with your Leverhulme um, Fellowship as well? Congratulations on that. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my my project uh, that I'm working on at Liverpool, um, which is a project that I got the Leverhulme Fellowship for, is a project um, on post-war uh, migration from the French Caribbean to metropolitan France. So it's really drawing on work that I did in the Giselle Pino chapter. Um, it's kind of come from that. So thinking about um, Les Giselle and Julia, which talks about migration in the 1960s. Um, and although um, the characters in Giselle Pino's uh, novel or autofictional novel um, migrated of their own accord, they, they didn't kind of, they didn't participate in a mass migration process. They are kind of reflective of a mass migration that happened in the 1960s from um, Guadeloupe and Martinique and also from Réunion and French Guiana to metropolitan France. So I'm looking at how um, this has been represented in cultural items, focusing on the Bumi Dome. So the Bumi Dome was a um, kind of like a, a recruitment agency almost. Um, it was a scheme that was set up in 1963 um, to plug the labor gap really after the Second World War. Um, and it was a very different, a very kind of specific um, planned process um, to get people, get young people, particularly from the, from the Caribbean islands um, where there was a risk of, of independence. So it's kind of bringing them over to metropolitan France. Um, and they were promised work um, in administration, but in reality, they were given low skilled um, underpaid jobs um, that, that kind of that the people didn't necessarily want to do um, and I'm looking at how this this um, migration scheme has been represented in a range of cultural items so thinking about, about literature because obviously that's where my background is but also looking at film and television um, I'll be looking at children's books as well and and BD. I'm also hoping to to kind of think about how these issues have been represented in museum exhibitions um, and um, kind of a, a range of cultural items. Um, and I'm going to Paris next week, so I will be able to do some archival research. Um, so lo really looking forward to, to, to doing that and getting into the archives um, and seeing what kind of historical um, details I can find um, to, to kind of create the historical background of the book. Thanks so much, Antonia. Thank, thanks, Natalie, for that question. You can see there's a real kind of organic development of the project going on into the next stages. And it's really, uh, really pleasing to hear that, Antonia. And, and, and again, you know, congratulations on the Leverhulme. Uh, Thank you very much, Jay. And I think, um, I mean, it, 
it, it, it's, it has been quite difficult, I think, for a lot of people, you know, over, over the past year, year and a half. I mean, doing archival work, it's also amazing to hear that you're finally going to be able to, to get over to Paris and, and look at some archives. You know, um, I think uh, anecdotally, we've had heard a lot of uh, people having having trouble uh, 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 working with the archives over the last uh, 18 months. So that's really good to hear. Well, thank you. Um, everyone for coming today and I can see there's some congratulations in the chat and uh, and thank yous in the chat. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask, we've got five minutes left, so if there are any further questions, please do pop your hand up or pop them in the chat. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the chat. Lots of thank yous, lots of congratulations. And it's a shame, I think, you know, one of these days, we're all going to meet in person again and raise a glass to uh, to your book, Antonio. And um, what I can do is kind of raise my cup of tea and say congratulations again, and um, all the best for the future. This this is really a a, a great book and um, a great success. So so thank you all. Just final thanks as well to our panelists today, to Natalie, to Leslie. Uh, to Amelina, who uh, took the time to come along today and, and, and help us celebrate Antonio's book. And, and final thanks to Antonio for, uh, for launching the book with us. And again, um, many congratulations. So I think we can probably uh, close today and, and say goodbye. So, so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Joe, and thank you to Natalie, Emelina um, and Leslie, and thank you every, uh, to everyone for coming. Um, it's been a really, really great session, so thank you. <laughs>